Well, thank you, Heinz. Um, we on here? There we go. Thank you very much. It's uh, a joy to be able to come back and speak again here in this area and with this new organization. I've uh, spoken a number of times up here in the Northwest when I was still working for ICR down in San Diego. Uh, it's always been a great enjoyment to come up here to see so many young earth creationists and to be able to take tours to Mount St. Helens and all up and down the West Coast. And uh, I was involved in many of those things. But uh, when I retired and came here, I, I settled out on Camino Island, been there almost eight years now. And so I wasn't able, was not able to do as much the last few years because I had a medical problem. But I'm beginning to do a little bit better again now, so I am and really appreciate the uh, invitation that Heinz made for me to come and speak tonight. I want to share with you uh, probably the most important project that I was involved in in my whole scientific career and as a Christian and as a creationist. And this is true of those who were involved in this particular project called the RATE Project, Radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth. And uh, let me give you a little bit of background. This started back in 1997. That's uh, 17 years ago. It ended uh, eight years later in 2005, which now is only, what, uh, nine years ago. So uh, it seems like a long time, but the significance of this project, I think, will continue for many years to come. Basically what happened was that there was an obvious issue that young earth creationists had not addressed having to do with the age of the earth. One of the most important pieces of evidence that is used by evolutionists and old earthers is the radioisotope decay products. Where did they come from? If you measure the rate at which radioactive material decays today, such as uranium turning into lead, various other radioisotopes, uh, carbon-14, for example, uh, the rate at which it decays and the amount that is around would indicate that the Earth has been here millions or billions of years. And yet, young Earth creationists say that can't be because the Bible says that the Earth is young. So that was the standard uh, explanation, just referring back to Scripture, which is a good argument, but it was not satisfying to most scientists and it was not really satisfying even to Christians because they began to say, is that really true? And so um, about 14 years ago, or 17 years ago, the Institute for Creation Research had a board meeting in which they were, one of our board members said, you know, we need to really address this issue. We haven't responded to that in a scientific way. And uh, nobody seemed to be willing to step up to the bat and uh, take that problem on. Now, one of the reasons that that was the case is that individual uh, creationists had tried to do that, and many of them had kind of had a uh, crisis in their faith because they couldn't solve the problem. And many young earth creationists had kind of given up on young earth creationism, and many of us were afraid to even touch it. Well, one of the things that we had not done was as a group try to solve this problem together. So I stepped, I stepped up to the bat and I told the board that I would try to organize a group of scientists to address this issue. And one of the, thing, one of the other things that we had done for many years was to criticize the evolutionary model but not try to solve any of the problems and offer an alternative to them from a scientific perspective. So this was kind of a new approach to this. We were actually going to do original basic research to try to address this issue. Now this became an issue because if we were unsuccessful, it was going to be extremely embarrassing to not only us as young earth creationists, but the Christian community as a whole. Because one of the things you need to do as a scientist is to be honest in your reporting. Now that may not sound the way it, science is done today, you know, about the global warming issue, all kinds of lying has been going on there, and scientists are involved in that. They're being pushed by politicians, and they've kind of uh, given in. But science, the way it is supposed to be done, is that when you find a result, you're supposed to report it and be honest about what you found. And so 
when I recruited a number of people, there was eight people that you see the names on the board up here, uh, that I recruited to be involved in this project, we had committed on ourselves that we were going to report what we found, no matter what, even if it was embarrassing, even if it was a problem for young earth creationism. Now, because that was such a big issue, and an emotional issue, and a, uh, um, an issue of credibility, we decided we needed to go to prayer in a big way. And we took scripture, and one of the people we took as our example was <coughs> um, when uh, uh, David was dealing with Goliath, you remember he was not a very young man, not a very old man. He was a young teenager, and he took on this giant who was twice as big as he was. And there's all kinds of history there I could go into, but I won't. But he took on this giant, and we decided to use his him as an example. So every year when we would meet, we met as a group, eight times during the eight years of the, or nine times during the eight years of the project in order to be able to interact with each other for a couple, three days, encourage one another, and we would start off with a devotion dealing with David and Goliath. And each one of us would give a devotional. And I, I still remember those meetings where we would pray and ask God to provide for us ideas, information, funds to be able to do the research. And God did provide not only the funds, which turned out to be about $2 million, which a creationist research project had never done anything like that. My typical research budget at ICR when I first started there was about $1,000 a year. This project, ICR stepped up to the plate and, and donated a half a million dollars over the lifetime of this project to this work. And they allowed me to solicit funds through our uh, monthly newsletter, Acts and Facts, and people recognized the importance and the significance of this project and gave another million and a half dollars over the eight years of the project. It was unheard of. But what was even more unheard of was that the people gave just at the time we needed the money. Much of the work that we did cost thousands of dollars just for the laboratory work. And uh, we didn't take a salary. I paid, uh, in the project, I paid for traveling expenses and, and meals and that sort of thing when we had meetings. And some of the uh, laboratory work was all covered by the project. But $2 million? That was amazing. And yet the Lord provided that for this project. So I'm here to give you a report that was really exciting about the results that we found. Let me uh, introduce you to the members of the project, starting in the front row on on uh, the left side there is Dr. John Baumgartner, a geophysicist. He was working at uh, Los Alamos National Laboratories when this project started. He's one of the world's leading modelers of geophysics. That's me in the middle. My background is in atmospheric science, but primarily because of my administrative experience working for the government on large projects, I was able to draw this project together and find the funding and so on. The gentleman in the beard on the right there is Dr. Russell Humphreys. He was a physicist at Sandia National Laboratories when this project started. Both of those men, John Baumgartner and Russ Humphreys, several years later, about three or four years into the project, retired and came to work full-time at ICR during that project and later. In the second row on the left side is Dr. Andrew Snelling. He is a what we call a hard rock geologist. He was working for Answers in Genesis at the beginning of this project and then came to work for ICR a little bit later. A hard rock geologist is one who works with igneous rocks primarily, and that's where we get a lot of the radioactive isotopes. That's where they're found. In the middle of the group is Dr. Steve Austin. He was a longtime employee of ICR. Uh, he's what we call a soft rock geologist. He works with sedimentary rocks and the flood-generated rocks that uh, were sand and muds that then hardened to become uh, sedimentary rocks. Um, um, in the uh, third one to the right there, kind of in the back, is Dr. Don DeYoung. He wrote the book Thousands Not uh, Millions, or Thousands Not Billions, which is the popular edition of the report that we did for this project. I'll tell you a little bit more about the reports. On the far right with the sunglasses is Dr. Gene Chaffin. He is a physicist. He was with uh, Bluefield College 
for a while and then at uh, Bob Jones University. And uh, he's primarily a theoretical physicist. In the back row on the left was Dr. John Morris, president of ICR. He still is the president today. Uh, John is basically responsible for giving me permission to do this project and to be able to solicit the funding, which is not the way IC normally, ICR normally did uh, projects. In fact, uh, well, I'll leave that alone. Uh, the gentleman in the back with the white hair is Dr. Kenneth Cumming. He was the head of our graduate program and also the, the director of the overall research at ICR. The tallest gentleman in the back was uh, Bill, um, Bill Hosh. He was one of Steve Austin's graduate students who then became a field technician and a laboratory technician. He prepared most of the samples that we got out of the field to go to the laboratories. And then Dr. Stephen Boyd uh, in the back right. Uh, he is the one uh, person who knows the Bible the best. He, he is a Hebraist, a specialist in Hebrew scripture, and he did studies to be able to demonstrate that scripture should be taken literally, not figuratively. And that deals with how we should address the age of the earth, the fact that the flood was a global flood. He's still doing research in that area today. So this is the group of people that were on the project, and it's, it's a really a joy to be part of this, and every one of them would say that the RATE project was the most important project they worked on during their lifetime, even today. Okay, now let me give you a few introductions to why this issue is so important. First of all, evolution requires long periods of time. Even if it could occur, which we don't think it could, if it did, it would have had to take long periods of time, billions of years, not just a few hundred or a few thousand years. So if in fact there were not billions of years, then evolution couldn't possibly occur. So that was one of the importance of it. Another one is that some Christians have accepted the idea of evolution and the long ages that go with it. And because of this, they, it has weakened their faith. If you have doubts that the Bible is really giving you the true stuff, that it's really true, then, and, and the, at the age it, it talks about the earth being only thousands of years old, and you think, well, maybe it's billions of years old, and maybe the Bible is just uh, a myth or not true, then you don't have the confidence in the other things that are important in the scriptures, such that Christ was deity. He was God. His death was in, required for our salvation. The Holy Spirit is alive and a well in this world and is working in our hearts. That Christ is coming back again. All those issues are important. And if you have questions on the basis of Scripture, why would you believe spiritual things when you don't even understand the things that you can see around you? That's kind of familiar with something that Jesus said, wasn't it, in John chapter 3. Well, the effect is to degrade the reliability of Scripture. So our most important purpose of this project was to bring credibility to the Word of God, to allow people to have more confidence in God's Word and to be able to believe it as it says. So the, the issue we were dealing with, is the earth really old? There are three basic assumptions in radioisotope dating. In fact, anything that you want to try to date something with has these essential assumptions. But particularly with the radioisotopes, a radioisotope, by the way, is an element that by breaking apart, converts into another element and results in some decay products. So a radi an isotope is, a, is a, there are a number of different elements that have slightly different characteristics, but a radioisotope is one of these that automatically, a few of them will break apart with time and decay, as it says. Um, one of the first assumptions is uh, of radioisotope dating, when you go out to try to use uh, radioisotopes to date something, is that there was no original concentration of a daughter element. Now, there's a parent element, such example would be uranium, and it decays and becomes lead. The lead is a daughter element. Now, it turns out we're going to talk about other elements that are formed. For example, helium is produced as well. That would also be a daughter element. So there's parent products and daughter products. Most of the dating is done by looking to see how much daughter element is there and how fast it occur, or how fast it developed. And from that, by measuring how much there is and how fast it appeared, you can estimate how old or how long this process has been going on and date the age of the Earth. 
The second assumption is that the constant re, uh, decay, the, the de decay rate has been constant with time. Now, most everybody has accepted that idea. In fact, most of the team <clears throat> on the rate project actually believed that. I believed it. I was taught that in school. I had no reason to believe otherwise. But we found out in this project, although we all assumed that that was the case, it turns out that it isn't. And it turns out that that is, in fact, one of the major reasons why radioisotope dating is not reliable. We were shocked at that. We were surprised at that. Finally, there is a third assumption, and that is that the radioisotope decay process occurs in a closed system. That is, when you have a parent element converting into a daughter element, none of, it is, none of the parent element is added or taken away, or the daughter element added or taken away, other than by the radioactive process itself. So you can be confident that no chemical processes or photoelectric processes or thieves break through and steal, taking away some of the products. That all is in a closed system, and you can use that to estimate the age of the Earth. Well, we were going to explore all of these issues. And so we had to set up some hypotheses. And what we did was we broke this project into two phases. There was a three-year initial phase called the preliminary phase, and then a five-year exploration phase. The first three years, we did literature search, we developed hypotheses, and tried to state what we were going to try to find or what we expected to find. And then the five-year project, we actually went out and did the research to try to find out what the answers were. The hypotheses that we started with were, first, that accelerated decay has occurred during creation, at the curse, and during the flood. In other words, accelerated decay. That if, in fact, the Earth is only 6,000 years old, and the process has been going on with all this material, there had to be some way in which it must have gone faster at some time in the past. How did that happen? So during that first three years, we talked about that, and we began to realize there had to be something called accelerated decay. So that this idea of a constant rate of decay must be, there must be something wrong with that. So we decided to hypothesize whether it was going to turn out to be true or not. We didn't know, but we hypothesized that there was such a thing as accelerated decay. Now, it doesn't mean we already found the answer. We only are stating the question, and then we had to either prove that or discount it. The second one was that some daughter elements may have actually been primordial. And in fact, you didn't start with zero amount at time zero, but there was actually some of those daughter elements there to start with. For example, uranium turning into lead, maybe there was a little bit of lead there to start with. We had no way of knowing, there was nobody there to tell you or to measure that, so we had to uh, at least uh, hypothesize the idea there may have been some that was primordial. Thirdly, uh, radio radioactive processes have produced evidence of accelerated decay. In other words, it isn't just enough to state it you have to be able to show it, and therefore the hypothesis would be in the field or in the geological column or when we go out and collect our samples of rocks, there must be some evidence of this. We can't just state it. We have to find evidence for it. So we began to collect data. That, that was the end of the first phase, and we reported this in a book that we published in the year 2000. It was called Radioisotopes in the Age of the, uh, Radioisotopes in the, Age of the Earth, a young earth creationist initiative. This was, we proposed the project with all the hypotheses and what we were going to do and what we hoped to be able to find. Then we started the five year research. Now there's a couple of other things I need to tell you here. And that is, one of the things that we thought about doing was setting up a laboratory at ICR and doing all of our own laboratory work. We decided against that for several reasons. First of all, the cost would have been prohibitive. Uh, we had about six or eight different types of uh, laboratory processes we had to do, and any one of those could have cost several hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe millions of dollars, to set up a laboratory. But the most important reason we didn't do it was because if we had done that, we would have likely been open to the criticism that we cooked the books. If we had done the laboratory research ourselves, we could have been accused of actually finding the evidence that we were looking for. So we decided 
to prepare the samples. We go out in the field, collect the rocks that we wanted. We would prepare the rocks, the samples, and then send them to conventional commercial laboratories. They would do the analysis and send us the results back, and then we would interpret the results. That way we had a safety. We, we didn't have to be accused of, of, of lying or hiding the truth. Because, as I said, we wanted to make this all open and above board. So our laboratory, and Bill Hoshu was our laboratory and field technician, we all got involved in collecting the samples, but Bill Hoshu got the lion's share of preparing the rocks. And it's kind of like a, a, a phys pharmacist mortar here, you'll see. That's a metal mortar and a pestle. But you use a, a giant sledgehammer to break these rocks apart to get the individual crystals in them and the individual elements broken apart so we can do the analysis. Uh, then we would have to separate these before we'd send them to the laboratory. So some of the materials we would put through sieves, different sized crystals would fall through the big sieves into the smaller one and then separate it out. So you could separate it into different types of crystals. Another way of doing this was to put the material that was broken apart in very finely uh, concentration concentrated sizes into a heavy liquid. And some of these liquids were really dangerous to work with, but they had different densities so that some of the crystals that had a certain density would float to the top of that liquid and others would sink to the bottom. Then you'd use another different density liquid and you could separate them that way. And you'd run them through filters, <coughs> collect these samples, and then send them <coughs> to the laboratory for analysis. Now we had all kinds of analyses that had to be done. Okay, now I'm going to report on four projects that had uh, separate results. And uh, there were other things that we did, but these were probably the critical ones that you need to know about. Excuse me, let me wet my whistle here. Okay, the first one is really responsible, was a project that uh, Dr. Russell Humphreys was responsible for. And it's the most numerical, or the most uh, clear-cut numerical example that really was significant for us. This was the helium that was produced by uranium turning into lead. And this all came from granite. Um, granite has uranium in it. It has little zircons. Well, if you've seen granite, in fact, I meant to have a bunch of granite rocks to pass around here, and I forgot to get them out of my trunk of my car. But you've probably seen granite rocks. If you go up on top of Highway 2, up on the top there, you see these white rocks all along the road there? That's granite, or granodiorite it's called. And it's a white, whitish type hard rock that came from the melt. That rock was all melted at one time. When it hardened, it formed little black specks in it that is biotite. It's a type of mica, which is in layers. And inside of that are little bitty zircons. And the zircons contain uranium and lead inside of those little crystals. And they're like they're, they're, they're in a, like a little prison. They're captured. They won't get out. By ana analyzing those little zircons, and by the way, zircons is the same as zirconium silicate. Uh, some of you ladies may have fake diamonds hanging on your earrings. Uh, your husband gave you them and told you they were diamonds. Well, they're, they're zircons. <laughs> um, at any rate, by analyzing those zircons for the uranium and the lead in there, we were able to determine that there was one and a half billion years on average of nuclear decay that occurred in those zircons, but by looking at the helium that was produced when the uranium turned to lead in those zircons, that is estimated to be somewhere between four and 8,000 years ago. In fact, there was an error bar involved in this so that the average value was about 6,000 years that these zircons converted uranium into lead. That's a familiar date, isn't it? That was amazing. We were surprised at that. Russ Humphreys couldn't believe it. Okay, let's get a little more detail here. These zircons that we find in the, in the biotite, in the granite, are really hard little crystals. In fact, they can go through a volcano, which would melt most rocks, but these zircons have such a high melting point that they were not melted. They would go blown out the top of a volcano and be incorporated in the lava or other rocks, and those little zircons would still continue to exist, 
restraining the uranium and the lead inside there. So you had a closed system. Now these little uh, zircons are very small. Here's what they look like. That's a, that little bar down there above the word zircons is 100 microns, or that's one micron is one millionth of a meter. Um, 100 microns is about one, let's see, 1,000 microns is a millimeter. So 100 microns would be one-tenth of a millimeter. So that width is about one-tenth of a millimeter, which is about the length of a zircon. The, the diameter is about 10 microns. That's about the width of the diameter of a hair on your head. So those are very, very small crystals. And it took a lot of work to separate those out from the rock samples that we got. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the ways that we finally had to do this and to get enough of them, it took a lot of work. We actually had, we actually hired a subcontractor to go in with tweezers and under a microscope, pick out these little zircons to put them in a pile so we got the right size. And so there was a lot of hard work involved in this. Here's a photo micrograph of a zircon done by Mark Armitage, one of the associates of our project. So it's about 20 microns in diameter and it had flat faces on it. It's a very interesting type crystal. Okay, now each time a uranium atom decays and becomes, it converts into a lead atom, it goes through a decay chain. On the upper left there, let's see if I can point it. On the upper left you see uranium 238 and as it converts it goes down to various elements through the nuclear decay to become lead 207 and it produces a helium atom in eight steps as it goes down from uranium to lead. So in addition to uranium becoming um, lead, it also produces helium. Now this helium was the alternative way that we did to uh, estimate the age of these rocks. Okay, here's a uranium atom with all the electrons rotating around it, and the nucleus is throwing out a, a, a smaller particle, which is actually made up of two protons and two neutrons, bound together without an electron. Let me go back and do that again. I like this. Okay, it, it produces these and it throws them out. That's the uranium decay. It throws out the nucleus of a helium atom because two neutrons and two protons, when it adds electrons, becomes helium. So inside of our rock, in our zircon, which is embedded in the biotite, embedded in the granite, is helium, which then has to escape out through the rock. So we've got all this helium that's a slowly escaping into our atmosphere. Now there's quite a history behind that, and that's why as an atmospheric scientist I got involved in this, trying to figure out why there wasn't more helium in the Earth's atmosphere if the Earth was billions of years old. It turns out the helium is still in the rocks. So when we went down and we found samples of rock, Dr. Baumgartner, who was at Los Alamos National Lab at the time, had access to some corings that were done as far as 12,000 feet down in the earth. They were looking for steam that they could make uh, generate uh, electrical power with. They were able to give us some cores from this, that, in, which, uh, in granite cores, which we were able to uh, analyze for the amount, uh, for the temperatures and the amount of helium that was still in the rock. Here you see a sam five samples at different depths. This is in meters. That'd be about uh, <clears throat> 3,000 feet down, about 6,000 feet down, a little more than about 9,000 feet, uh, and so on. At those depths, the temperature in, in degrees centigrade is a little over 100 degrees. That's about the boiling point of water at 3,000 feet down all the way to almost 300 degrees centigrade, which I forget what it is, but it's much hotter than boiling point of water. The amount of helium that was in the rock was dependent upon how hot the temperature was. Down at the very bottom where the temperature was the hottest, there was only one-tenth of one percent of the helium still there that would have decayed in one and a half billion years. Up near the top, there was still 58 percent of the helium still in the rock. So the helium that we were looking for is still in the rock even today, and it depends on the temperature. The hotter the temperature, 
the faster the helium will diffuse out of the rock. Now, why is that important? Well, it turns out that when you put a graph together like this, which I won't spend a lot of time on, it turns out that the hotter the temperature, in this case, the hot temperature is to the left. Here is the hottest temperature, 500 degrees. Here's about the boiling point of water. A measure of how fast the helium escapes from the rock called diffusivity goes up at higher temperatures. And this tells us and there's a way to be able to estimate how old the Earth is from this for how much helium is still left in the rock. It turns out that if the Earth is four and a half billion years old or the rock is one and a half billion years old, which, we est which is the conventional idea, the uniformitarian model would have a very low diffusivity. If the Earth is young, it would be up here five orders of magnitude higher. In other words, the helium would have had to have diffused out um, about 100,000 times faster than it would have if the Earth is old. So what is the actual diffusivity? This was the model that we estimated, and so we then wanted to take a sample, send it to the lab, and see what the actual diffusivity was. Turns out nobody had ever measured that. Nobody had ever tried to see how fast helium diffuses out of rock. Well, when we sent it to the laboratory, and I have to tell you a little side story here, we sent it to a laboratory in Pasadena, California, at uh, Cal State, uh, or no, not Cal State, at uh, Caltech, Caltech uh, to one of the world's leading experts on measuring diffusion of gases out of rocks, but we didn't tell him who sent it to him. We sent it through a mining company. Because if we had sent it to him directly, he would have refused to do it. He wouldn't have had anything to do with creationists. Now, that's not deceptive because mining companies do this all the time because they don't want people to know where they're doing the mining to find out the minerals that they're getting. So it's a standard practice. We asked this mining company who had some friends of ours in it, and they sent it to the lab. He did all the work, published it, put it in the journals, and sent us the results. And then later, when he found out what he had done, he was quite upset at us, as you can imagine. But what he found was that the diffus diffusivity matched our creation model exactly. In fact, Dr. Humphrey said he had never done any research project that had resulted in a result that was so accurate uh, to that degree of, of confirmation. Well. So what we did was that we essentially developed an alternative to the uranium lead clock. And here's how it works. If you had two sand dials, the one on the left is uranium converting into lead with a little uh, valve. You got the uranium at the top and the lead at the bottom with a little valve in between that is adjustable, that little valve there. And over on the right side is our helium clock, which is an alternative to the uranium. If we turn that valve there on the left and the uranium starts to turn into lead at an accelerated rate, which is what we were proposing, it's producing helium at an exaggerated rate or at a high rate. But in going into the sand clock over there, it turns out that the diffus diffusivity was not affected by this change in the nuclear decay rate. It's a whole different system. So the helium began to build up in the rock. In this case, it shows it stayed in the top of the sand dial and was falling through at the same rate we have today. Then sometime later, that valve was closed off and it came back to the same rate that it was going on before. You find all this lead in the bottom of the sand dial indicating that the Earth is billions of years old. But yet, if you go over and you look at the helium in that lower sand dial, since it was continuing to accumulate at the normal rate, not at an accelerated rate, then you find that this process would indicate that the Earth is very young. And when you look at it, the uranium lead deal gives one and a half billion years for this process. And over on the right side where we had the helium clock, it shows it to be 6,000 years. Plus or minus 2,000 years was the result of this project. So we developed an alternative clock for estimating the age of the Earth which agrees with scripture, by the way. That was the whole point of this thing. 6,000 years versus 1.5 billion years. That's a big difference. 
Okay, now I need to go to another one. This is a little harder to explain, so I'm going to skip over some of the details. But this one was headed by Andrew Snelling, and he looked at something called polonium radio halos. Some of you may have heard of these ideas. But it turns out that when uranium is converting into lead and producing helium, these little particles that are shot out by the uranium decay produce damage in the surrounding crystal. And uh, we look for, uranium, uh, for uh, granite in various places all over the world, including Stone Mountain in Georgia, including the uh, uh, Yosemite National Park. And here I, I like to share with you one of my favorite stories because Andrew is a good friend of mine and we used to go backpacking together a lot. But we went to uh, Yosemite National Park with our, my, with our wives. My wife went with us and Andrew's wife. And we were going to collect rock samples in uh, Yosemite to be able to do analysis for this project. And uh, I'm not an expert in anything, uh, collecting samples or preparing them or interpreting them. So I went along as Andrew's uh, sidekick or as his assistant geologist, which meant I get to carry the rocks. Uh, anyway, I had a backpack. We started at the top up at Glacier Point in Yosemite. We went down the trail, which is about six miles long, down to the canyon. and We stopped every few hundred yards to uh, collect a rock sample. Andrew had his GPS with him so he could tell exactly where he was within six feet or so. But now remember, you can't just do this uh, without getting permission. We had to get a permit from the National Park Service, which took about a year to get. And uh, one of the conditions they specified was that you couldn't do this out in the open so the public could see you. You had to, as you walked down the trail, you kind of had to wait for a gap in the people walking up and down the trail and then hit the rock and break off a piece and let, let them see you do it. So we were kind of playing hide and seek on the trail. Uh, anyway, as we went down the trail, we collected about 40 of these hand-sized rock samples. We put them in a plastic bag and labeled them and all that. By the time we got to the bottom of the trail, my backpack was 40 pounds. So the moral of this story is don't become a geologist assistant. <laughs> At any rate, uh, we collected samples. And then what we were looking for was, and looking in those little black specks in there in the mica, where the zircons are embedded, you'll find damage in the form of circles. Now, the damage actually is in the form of a sphere around the zircons. But because in the mica, you can peel off the mica layers, you can actually see the damage in a circle, and you get down to the point that it's exactly centered on the zircon crystal. And the size and the intensity of all those little circles tells you what kind of element is radioactive. Uh, uranium produces these halos. Uh, polonium produces the halos, thorium. We were looking for polonium because polonium is a byproduct of uranium as it's converting down to lead. And it turns out it has a very short half-life. The half-life, okay, here we go. The, uh, the, uh, the zircon, which contains the uranium, is throwing out all these particles and it produces this damage in a spherical shell around the zircon in the rock and in the biotite. And when you peel it off, you get a layer of it. And as the, here's the, what the granite looks like, the black specks is the biotite. In that is the zircon, which then produces the damage, which if you peel it off in the layers, it's circular or two-dimensional. And the polonium that's produced at the same time is actually drifted by water flowing through the granite downstream from where the uranium particle was to start with. And we were able to find those, and by knowing how far they went, we could tell how long it had been since they were moved. Now, the importance of this is this. The polonium halos only have a half-life. That is, half the material decays to form these little rings on the order of seconds or minutes or at most about a month. So it's a very quick process. Now, they do not form the radio halos when the rock is molten. The rock has to be solid. So it had to cool rapidly and the radio halos had to form rapidly, which meant all of that, pro and it had to be millions and millions of these little specks that would produce that, that had to happen in a matter of minutes or days, which says this couldn't have happened over millions or billions of years. So we have direct evidence in the decay process 
causing damage in the rock that this process occurred in very short periods of time. Now that has also implications on how fast the cooling of the rock occurred, which Dr. Andrew Snelling is still publishing on. Now, we looked at uh, this, this, I'm gonna go over this very quickly, but we looked at the conventional age and compared the number of radio halos with that. We found that they tended to be grouped around the classical time of about 400 million years. And there's a period of time there when which they happened. Now those that 400 million years is conventional time, but if you convert it to biblical time, it would be on the order of years. Okay, uh, that's a little hard to explain. I'm going to skip this one also because I'm beginning to run out of time. These are some of the places in the Grand Canyon we collected um, um, samples. I'm going to go on directly to the carbon-14 so I don't slight this. Dr. John Baumgartner was the primary principal investigator on this project. This one's the easiest to understand and is really significant. <clears throat> carbon-14 is an isotope of carbon-12. It turns out that carbon-14, when it's formed, is radioactive. Carbon-12 practically never decays, but carbon-14 does. In fact, it has a half-life of almost 6,000 years, 5,700 years to be exact. That is half of the carbon-14 that we find in our atmosphere, which is where you find the carbon-14, decays to carbon-12 in 5,700 years. That means that in about 50,000 years at most, all the carbon-14 would have disappeared in the atmosphere. Now, we still have carbon-14 in our atmosphere today. So where did it come from and how did this process occur? Well, let me show you. Uh, we were looking at bones, uh, dinosaur bones, various kinds of bones, coal, which is compressed and solidified organic material. Coal is thought to be 100 million years old. And people have thought, well, there can't be any carbon-14 in coal. People have looked for it for a long time and they never found any until about 20 years ago, a new instrument was built called a, spectra, a radio spectrometer, which had the ability to measure extremely small quantities of carbon-14. And they started finding carbon-14 in coal. Now, how could that be? If the coal is 100 million years old, all the carbon-14 that was collected by the plants into the coal would have all decayed to carbon-12. You shouldn't find any. Well, it turns out, we didn't discover this until we were a couple of years into our project, that it had been reported in the standard literature that they had been finding it. But the conventional scientific community couldn't believe it. They thought there must be some mistake in their instrument. It's contaminated in some way. So there was actually 70 scientific articles in the literature reporting on carbon-14 and coal saying they can't be there. There's something wrong with our instruments. Well, we found this out and decided this may be a good example of, or a good uh, project to work on for our age of the earth issue. Here's an example of a radio ice, uh, spectrom spectrometer. Here's how carbon-14 is formed in the atmosphere. You have carbon-12 in the atmosphere, and you have a little bitty bit of carbon-14. The carbon-14 is formed when cosmic radiation hits nitrogen in the atmosphere, nitrogen-14 molecule, breaks it apart, and it forms a carbon-14 atom and a nitrogen-14 atom. So it's a very small amount, but it's measurable in the atmosphere. This carbon-14 then is incorporated in the plants that grow in the atmosphere, or in on the earth, and the cows and that eat the plants, incorporate that carbon-14 that comes from the plants. We eat the cows, and we get carbon-14 in it. We have a balance between our bodies, the plants, and the atmosphere. They have about the same ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. But when the plant or the animal dies, here's a dead cow for you, the carbon-14 continues, continues to decay and becomes carbon-12, and with time, you have less and less carbon-14. By measuring the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 in a dead animal or a piece of wood or a dinosaur bone or coal, you can estimate how long that animal has been dead or formed. Well, if there is 
carbon-14 decaying during the flood. It was in the trees from the atmosphere. The flood came along and buried all the trees and the plants and the animals. And the carbon-14 that was in there has been decaying since that time. We should be able to estimate how long it's been since the flood occurred based on the amount of carbon-14 that's in that dead material. Now that we have this instrument that can measure very small quantities of carbon-14. Well, it turns out when we do that, we estimate, first of all, this is the 70 papers that were published. I won't go into the details here. For, this is not, a, well, I, I just won't go into the details. This was the 70 papers that we uh, plotted. We did our own experiment. Dr. Austin had access to coal from the coal laboratory, the federal government's coal laboratory at uh, Penn State University. And we did the same thing with 10 samples throughout the depth of the coal column and found basically the same result. But by and large, the coal that was there gave an estimate, oh, wait a minute, let me don't do this yet. It gave an estimate that the coal would be about 50,000 years old at the most. Not 100 million years old, but 50,000. That's a much smaller quantity. But in addition to that, if you take into account that the, all the organic material was buried by the flood and it changed the concentration of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, that would have affected it by about a factor of five or more. So that brings down the age of the Earth to about 10,000 years or less, just based on the amount of carbon-14 that's in coal. Now, one of the first criticisms that's going to come along is, well, coal possibly is contaminated. It's in a layer under the Earth. Water is percolating down from storms through the ground, and it can bring down recent or current concentrations of carbon-14 into the coal layer that's below and contaminate that coal layer. So maybe that's where that carbon-14 is coming from. Well, Dr. Baumgartner then had a brilliant idea. He says, well, let's look at diamonds. Diamonds are all made out of carbon, but they are the hardest substance known to man. They cannot be contaminated by rain or any other material getting inside the diamond. So let's take some diamonds and crush them up and see what we find. Well, it took us a year or two to get this process down because we found a lab up in Canada that was willing to do the process but you had to melt the diamonds first. And so the temperatures had to be thousands of degrees. And they ground up the diamonds into diamond dust and put it in their oven to melt it. But the diamonds kept exploding. They kept blowing up their furnace. Finally, after a year or two of trial, they finally got the process down. We were able to get the diamond dust vaporized and through the spectrometer and they were able to measure the amount of carbon-14 in diamonds. And it came out almost exactly the same way coal did. There is carbon-14 in diamonds, and diamonds are on the order of 10,000 years or less in age. Now that really flies in the face of truth uh, to the secular community, because diamonds are thought to be on the order of a billion years old, coming from down deep in the earth and being a billion years old, and yet they got carbon-14 in them. So they have to be young now, based on these measurements, too. Now, uh, here's our diamond, where it has all the carbon-14 in it. And you see, inside the diamond, the carbon-14 is converting to nitrogen-14. And so the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 is changing, indicating that this is how we're able to measure the age of the diamond. And it's not affected by external processes. Now, we reported these results at the... 19, or 2003 um, conference in San Francisco, the, uh, uh, boy, I slipped my mind now, the name of the conference, but it's the world's largest conference of geophysicists. They come together about two to three weeks before Christmas. We reported there was all four of these project, or three of these project results there, and we had the world's leading laboratory people, theoretical people, geophysicists come by our examples and talk with us Many of them just scratching their heads, say, this can't be. I don't believe it. But the evidence seems to be that case. They then went back to their laboratories and they repeated the same results that we did, uh, repeated the same experiments we ran and found exactly the same results. It's been devastatingly quiet from the scientific community. But they, from our 
contacts inside, we found out they have not been able to refute those pieces of data. So to us, these are extremely significant results. And we feel that our prayer of asking for God's help in our battle like David had with Goliath, in which he finally said in front of Goliath, I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. The Lord saveth not with sword and spear. The battle is the Lord's. He will give you into our hands. So that's what we felt when we did this. Now, if you don't think that research isn't exciting when you're dealing with these kind of stakes, it was enjoyable. It was fun. It was challenging. And as I said, the eight of us involved in this project are the main researchers. We believe this was the most important thing we were ever involved in. So we found this result. Whoops, I've got to go here to the end. I'll come back to the... It's a young world after all. Isn't that a wonderful result? Okay, I want to give you a few references here to some materials. Um, first of all, the second and final report for this project was called Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth, a Young Earth, the Results of a Young Earth Research Initiative. That was published in 2005. <coughs> it's almost 600 pages of highly technical material. Those are all sold out now. We had about 5,000 copies of that. They weigh about four pounds each. They make a great doorstop. Only scientists and engineers would want to read one of those. Uh, it's still available on the internet. Uh, we're all sold out and they're not going to be reprinted, but you can, if you're really into it, you can go on the internet and find them available at amazon.com. The more popular version, thousands not billions, the book by Don DeYoung, which kind of summarizes those results in a paperback about 140 pages long. Uh, I believe uh, Heinz said there was, did you say there was any copies out there? Not, none out there, okay. You can order them though. If you want to, end, if you want to order some of those, you can get them and they'll have them for your next meeting. There's also uh, a DVD called Thousands Not Billions that you see all the scientists themselves talking about these results. And that's the result of the rate project. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Well, that was a, an innovative uh, coverage of some of the experiments you did. I think you, you said that there were uh, eight experiments in total. Well, um, yeah, the, another one that I skipped over there, for example, was there are inconsistencies in the various radioisotopes. In other words, when you look at uranium converting into lead, you look at neodymium converting into uh, strontium into neodymium, um, um, uh, there's okay, four. Yeah, but, but, but the point is, you covered three here. Now, the, the book covers all eight of them? Yes. Yeah, yeah the, the technical book covers all eight of them. Yeah. But just about to say was that the, uh, the different types of radioisotopes all give different ages for the same rock. There's something wrong with the radioisotope dating method simply in consistency even in the same rock. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to open this up to questions. So if you have a question... Put your hand up and I'll come around with the microphone. But uh, in the meantime, also, we're going to take a free will offering for those of you that would uh, like to help us uh, support this ministry. And if the three gentlemen could come forward and uh, start that. So if you have a question, put up your hand. What does RATE stand for again? R-A-T-E. Radioisotopes and the age of the earth. We used a little creative uh, letter in there. And by the way, the naming of a project is really more important than you might think because it's a really shorthand way of telling people what you're trying to do. So we used the word rate, uh, and that really got people's attention. I, it took me a month to come up with that name. <laughs> uh, we almost came up with rope. It was supposed to be um, uh, reorganization of planet Earth. But uh, by rope, we figured our critics would say, well, give them enough rope and they'll hang themselves. You know, that kind of thing. Could you explain uh, a little more about the carbon-14 
um, I didn't quite understand how it got from 50,000 to 10,000. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> when the flood occurred, well, first of all, the, the amount of carbon-14 that's in the atmosphere has to do with the amount of carb, the ratio of the carbon-14 and the, the amount of carbon-12 that's in the atmosphere. The carbon-12 is in equilibrium with the organic material that's growing on the surface of the Earth. So the more organic material you have, the more carbon-12 you'll have in the atmosphere because it has to be in equilibrium. Some of that carbon, or the, the, the carbon-14 is produced by cosmic radiation hitting nitrogen in the atmosphere, producing the carbon-14. So that change, as it turns out, it was assumed in the traditional dating method that that was always constant, but it turns out it's not. And we suspect and believe that when the flood occurred, because all of the organic material on the surface of the Earth was buried suddenly, that balance between the carbon-12 in the atmosphere was changed because there wasn't any carbon, there wasn't any organic material in the surface, so it changed dramatically and it had to grow back again. So by measuring the amount of carbon, the ratio of carbon 14 to carbon 12, we believe there was about a five-fold change in that ratio just due to the fact that all that organic material was buried. Now, to get into more detail than that is, I'll have to refer you to Dr. Baumgartner. He's written a number of articles on that if you want to get into it. Look up on the internet, Dr. John Bar Baumgartner, Carbon 14, and you'll find all kinds of papers. I have a question. Yes, sir. Is there any plans in the future now to bring this information beyond the scientific world and into the general public? Well, that was the idea behind the uh, Thousands Not Billions book by Don DeYoung. Um, Unfortunately, the book was a, written at a little bit higher level than I had hoped it would be. Um, it hasn't been converted into a, a more popular version. And uh, basically the reason for that is it's thought that this is so technical people just can't grasp onto it. Some of you in the audience here probably can sympathize with that. So there just hasn't been enough effort to make that more understandable for the general public. I would like to see that, but it just hasn't happened. Understanding that you were in a huge spiritual war, was there any ever a time during that eight years that any of the eight of you thought, uh-oh, and how much of the $2 million budget was added up by crushing them diamonds? <laughs> <laughs> I think the diamonds probably totally cost maybe at most $5,000, so it wasn't that big a percentage of the project. Um, there was, it was an interesting thing. We were kind of getting one result after another, which was so encouraging. I don't think we ever really got discouraged. Probably the most discouraging part, if, if there was one, was at the very beginning because we didn't know what the answers were. We didn't have any great confidence in ourselves that we were going to find an answer, and we were worried. But as things began to develop and as we met together and encouraged one another, that was the importance of this group functioning together, not just one individual. Because one person, when he couldn't get an idea, another one would suggest something. Or if somebody had an idea that didn't hold water, he would, he would dash his, his hopes because, no, that doesn't work. You know, you gotta do this. So it was a team effort and it truly worked. It was, it was very innovative. This is actually done all the time in, in standard uh, science but we just haven't had the cohesiveness of creationists or the funds to do that kind of thing before. Uh, there is some more of those kind of things going on today. The Creation Research Society, uh, Answers in Genesis, uh, Creation Ministries in International. Other groups are now doing group type research projects and it really is paying off. Yes, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not sure if, uh, if your project to open this proverbial can of worms or if it was just coincidence, but <clears throat> in the years since your project, uh, it seems that there have been so many additional discoveries related to the carbon-14 issue. And, and everything I've read is that carbon-14 is in everything. Anything that has residual carbon has carbon-14 in it, including uh, soft dinosaur tissue. And can, can you speak to that, every, the things that have happened since your project? 
Well, I have to admit that uh, I've been kind of out of the loop for the last few years because of my illness, um, which, by the way, was cancer, and I, I'm now clear of cancer, So, but I'm still having a lot of medication issues, so I'm not uh, keeping up on it as much as I would like to. I just don't have the energy. Um, but there are others who are, and one of the projects that I know that uh, is really significant, and I'd like to see more of it done, one of the things that I did before we kind of ground to an end on that project, oh, and that, that, that's another point. We decided that we weren't going to have a project that just went on forever and ever. I set this up so it was an eight-year project. It had a definite end so that we had certain expectations we had to complete, and if we didn't complete it, that was the end of the project. It kind of forced us to be more efficient. It also didn't mean that we would continue soliciting funds forever and ever and just kind of run out of enthusiasm and waste money. So it was very narrow and very focused. Um, but the project that I wanted to continue was looking at meteorites. And I, we went so far as to purchase a meteorite. I paid about $6,000 for an eight pound meteorite. We did some initial analysis on it to find out whether we could do a lot of the chemical analysis that we did on the other rocks here on Earth, and it was good enough to do that, but then it kind of stopped. But Dr. Snelling has planned, is continuing to do some of that work at Answers in Genesis, and the idea being, if this process occurred on the Earth, did it happen in space as well? And that has some significance for not only the age of the Earth, but the age of the universe. So I'm hoping that will continue. So has there been uh, any carbon-14 uh, dating on dinosaur fossils, perhaps? Do you know of anything like that? Well, there's a lot of people that are uh, working on dinosaur fossils. They're primarily looking at uh, the DNA, you know, and, and the main argument there is that DNA only has a limited lifespan because it deteriorates, and yet when you find DNA that's still uh, viable in dinosaur bones, that implies right away that the dinosaur is much younger. So that's the primary focus of that research. Um, I think there's probably some peripheral carbon-14 work on that as well, but I, I'm not familiar with it. One of the biggest problems with um, dinosaur fossils, again, is this issue of contamination. Uh, you have to be concerned that the uh, carbon-14 is not coming in from the outside like contamination of coal. So that, that's a big issue you have to resolve. And I think that's true with the DNA as well, but I don't know enough about that. That's life science and I'm dead science. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, uh, let me ask the last question then. And, and that is, uh, have you gotten any feedback from the secular community at, at all on the results? Well, the feedback, uh, <laughs> this is kind of interesting. Now, this happened a number of years ago, and it was about the time we were getting ready to start the project. Uh, there's a fellow by the name of Malcolm Dalrymple who wrote a book, The Age of the Earth. It's kind of the classic in the field for secular scientists. Uh, and he's always been critical of creationists. He also uh, sponsored a little conference or a meeting each year when the, when the um, American Association of Science, let's see, AA, I forget, it's one of the main, uh, it's, it's the organization that, that publishes Science Magazine. They have an annual meeting and he would present a little status report on what creationists are doing. So when he found out about the RAID project, uh, uh, he, was, he, he basically reported, these guys are finding some very interesting information, but they can't be right because they're creationists. There's something circular about that, I think. <laughs> so I don't know if you can take that as an advocacy or not, but basically he and a number of other people, like the ones that came to the conference, it was the American Geophysical Union meeting, by the way, AGU meeting in San Francisco, um, they basically uh, would have reported a criticism of our project and wiped out all of what we found if they had been able to find a way to do it. So that's an argument from silence, which I don't particularly care for, but um, only through kind of behind the scenes information have we heard 
that they really think what we've done has some legitimacy. They're, most scientists are unwilling to get into the controversy of the politics of creation versus evolution or global warming and all that sort of thing. But um, those who are Christians and are willing to at least speak behind the scenes seem to be very supportive of what we, we've done. Well, let's give uh, Larry a hand for that. Uh.